want to thank you all for coming, making time for this event, um, organized by the Consortium for Christian Muslim Dialogue. Uh, this is an event that um, kind of uh, captivated a lot of people. There are people in the city who are interested in this, and some of them are already joining us from online. Uh, we have the Focolare group of um, people here in Pittsburgh who have been working with us, very strong community of Catholics into interreligious inter relationship. Some of our Muslim friends are also connecting with us today. Um, some parish here in the city are joining us. But most importantly, we're happy that our speaker made it on time. <laughs> and she's been here waiting. So that we are sure of. And since we have her, everything can roll on then. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the consortium. And I want to leave you in the good hands of Father Bill Christie, who is um, the university uh, chaplain. Um, Charles de Foucault worked primarily a lot in uh, North Africa, and the Spiritans have a lot of mission around that. So they intersect each other, and which is why we're happy that um, the Spiritans here in the community, in the campus, got very interested in this event and are uh, participating with us. So I'd like to invite Father Bill Chrissy to get the ball rolling. Yes, if you've ever had a clementine, then you have tasted the Spiritan work in Algeria. Brother Clement was one of our Spiritan brothers who taught at the agricultural school outside of Algiers, and he was the one who developed the clementine. So if you've ever tasted a clementine, you've tasted some of our Spiritan ministry in North Africa. My friends, we have been called here this afternoon by a wonderful collection of scholars with varied interests and areas of specialization. The Consortium for Christian Muslim Dialogue has taken the lead on today's event and has organized, uh, has taken point in this afternoon's talk. The CCMD has been bolstered with assistance from their co-sponsors, which are the McAnulty College of Liberal Arts, the Center for African Studies, the Department of Catholic Studies, the Interfaith Student Organization, and the Department of Theology. Now, the point of convergence for these organizations and departments is a French aristocrat, a bon vivant, a soldier, a monk, and a hermit, Charles de Foucault. Blessed Charles is to be canonized by Pope Francis on the 15th of May. And we are here this afternoon to deepen our appreciation of Blessed Charles's life, ministry, and even more so to reflect on, his missionary, on how his missionary method and spirituality might be an insight for us in our own work, ministry, interpersonal relations, and our spiritual life. For this afternoon's reflection, we have invited Dr. Bonnie Thurston to offer a lecture on his life and his approach to interreligious relations. The title of her talk is A Christian Presence in a Muslim Home, The Interfaith Etiquette of Charles de Foucault. Dr. Thurston, uh, formerly the William F. Orr Professor of New Testament at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, has written uh, many works, including Hidden in God, Discovering the Desert uh, Vision of Charles de Foucault, which was named among the very best spiritual books of 2016 by Spirituality and Practice. She has also authored three articles on Blessed Charles and many other books of theology poetry, including To Everything a Season, A Spirituality of Time, Shaped by the End uh, shaped by the end you live for, Thomas Burton's monastic spirituality, and St. Mary of Egypt, a modern verse life and interpretation. Dr. Thurston began her academic career as a student of English, studying at Bethany College and at the then again at the University of Virginia. 
Her PhD in English from the University of Virginia also included her turn towards religious studies, which she continued to follow in her postdoctoral work at Harvard Divinity, uh, Enhard Karls University in Germany, and Ecole Biblique in Israel. Dr. Thurston has left the classroom and is currently back in her native West Virginia. She lectures and has concentrated again on her love for poetry. Forgotten Futures, a memoir, and Not Sonnets are soon to be published this year. And so it is with my great joy that we welcome Dr. Bonnie Thurston. Thank you for that gracious introduction. Um, thank you to the theology department and especially to Therese Bonin, who was so kind in making all the arrangements and answering all the questions uh, to get me here. And, and a special thanks to Duquesne University and the co-sponsors of our um, afternoon together. This is wonderful. Um, we're going to be thinking together about visiting other people's homes. And so I'd like to begin by reminding us that refugees are visitors in other people's homes. And um, to begin by remembering the Holy Family who were refugees in Egypt and the Hijra of the Prophet, upon whom be peace, um, was in a way driven from one city to another. Um, we see on the television the refugees from Ukraine and Syria and Palestine, from the Tigray region of Ethiopia and places in Africa and Asia, from Central America and Mexico, and from all the places on the earth where people have been forced to leave their homes and their countries and their cultures. And so I would like to begin um, with a moment of silence. And if you are so minded and comfortable in that silence to um, Lift up a prayer to God who is Rahman, Arahim, compassion and mercy, um, that God would look after all the refugees this night. So let's just take a moment to begin that way. Thank you. Shukran. Um, all of us have probably had the experience of visiting somebody else's house or somebody else's home. Um, as a child, I was absolutely flabbergasted to discover that other people's families didn't work like ours did um, and that the rules in other people's houses were not like the rules in our house. And when I would visit with my friend Frankie or Joanne or Mary Ann, my mother always said, now you have to be a good guest, be a good guest. And that involved um, learning a new series or a new set of rules. Maybe you've been in another country or had an opportunity to, to study abroad, or maybe you've come to us to study here um, and, and discovered that we, we have to learn another etiquette because what's polite here might be very naughty in somebody else's country. And what's polite there might be very naughty here. And most of us want to be good guests. We want to be good guests in someone else's home. And we remember, too, that um, our friendships and our romances, um, our experiences of our being guests in other people's hearts. And so we have to be to tread carefully there, if you remember that wonderful poem by W.B. Yeats. So I'd like you to keep in mind the common experience of visiting in somebody else's home as we think about Charles de Foucault's life and um, his understanding of what it might mean to be a missionary or to be a guest in another person's home. Um, the French spiritual master and himself the great Islamicist Louis Massignon uh, was greatly influenced by Foucault. And Massignon wrote, and this is the quotation on the outline, and you can follow along and see how close you are to dinner by following through on the outline. Um, Foucault wrote, to understand the other one does not need to annex him, but to become his guest. 
to understand the other. We don't need to annex her, but to become her guest. And the image of a guest is somebody who comes into another person's home and receives guests and defers to the customs and helps us to understand the other um, is, is really Brother Charles's uh, contribution to interfaith understanding. We'll talk more about this in a moment. I'm going to start with a biographical sketch for those of you who don't know very much about him. Talk about how he managed to return to Christianity because of the influence of Islam. If that's not interfaith, I never heard it. Um, and then some, some of his attitudes, uh, which we now in the 20th century find, I think, a little shocking um, on the part of a 19th century person. And then finally, we'll, we'll have some practical, uh, some practical implications. Um, we already know from his name, Charles de Foucault, is that, that he's a French aristocrat. So I'm going to probably refer to him as Brother Charles to give us one step away from French colonialism in North Africa in the 19th century. But he wasn't ap aristocratic. He was born in 1858 to a deeply faithful Roman Catholic family. Six years later, both his parents were dead. He was raised and undoubtedly spoiled by his grandparents. He had a very good education, educated at the Lycée in Nantes by the Jesuits in Paris, and was, to be polite about it, an indifferent student. That's when you have to write one of those red recommendation letters, and the person you have to write for was pretty awful, so you have to find a way to say something nice. So we'll just say he was an indifferent student. By the time he attended military academies, too, in France, he had lost his faith, and again, to use a polite term, he was living profligately. I'll, I'll leave it up to your unpure imaginations to figure out what that might mean. He received commission as a second lieutenant in the 4th Hussars in 1879, was posted to North Africa and briefly put on leave for disobedience, um, and then distinguished himself, actually, as a soldier in Algeria. In 1882, he resigned his commission in the French army to explore what was then the uncharted territory of Morocco. And again, there was an interfaith piece to this because in order to get into Morocco, he disguised himself as a Jew and traveled with a rabbi. So from 1883 to 1884, he, was, he passed um, as, as another religious, in another religious tradition and another culture. When he came home, he wrote an extremely good book on Morocco. It was the first real sort of geopolitical study of what is now the country of Morocco, and he won the gold medal from the French Geographical Society for this. Uh, he was very much celebrated in France. He returned to Paris in 1886, and he returned to the church that same fall. Having sincerely prayed for some time, my God, if you exist, let me know you. It's a good inquirer's prayer. You know, if you, let, if you exist, let, let me know that you do. His spiritual master, Father Henri Hevelin, who himself was an extraordinarily spiritual person, facilitated Foucault's return to the church and became his spiritual director and remained so for the rest of his life. Foucault later wrote, and I think this is quite Wonderful. As soon as I believed there was a God, I understood that I could do nothing other than to live for him. My religious vocation dates from the same moment as my faith. So once he knew there was a God, there was no choice for him except to live for God alone. He had a vocation. That was clear. What the vocation was was not at all clear. I remember that in university a lot. I was pretty sure there was something I was supposed to do, but I was pretty clueless about what it was. So the next little section of the life of Brother Charles was, was finding out what he was, what he was to do. And before I go to that, I, I want to say um, that uh, I'm quoting a lot of writers from the 19th century, and I am a pedant. <laughs> 
God forgive me. So I don't think I can change their quotations. So if the reference to God as masculine is troublesome to you, could you just do a little translation in your own mind, please? I'm not ignoring the problem, but I don't really feel I should change somebody else's writing. So that uh, I, I, I just need to give you a little war warning on that. The first um, vocation that Foucault uh, explored was life as a Trappist monk. And as you know, the Trappists are a, um, uh, one of the groups in the Benedictine family, probably the most austere. And um, Foucault found that the Trappists were not strict enough for him. He was horrified when the Pope gave the Trappists permission to use butter and oil <laughs> in their cooking. Uh, nevertheless, uh, many have noted that the Trappist years from 19, 1890 to 1897 shaped his mentality and almost everything he did thereafter. It, it was, for him, the model of the idea of perfection and the elements that made up the monastic life um, really were points of reference for him ever thereafter. But he didn't stay in the monastery. He traveled to the Holy Land, and as you know, probably he became a servant to the poor clares in, um, uh, in Nazareth. In fact, you can still in Nazareth go to the convent where uh, he had served the sisters, then in Jerusalem. It was actually two abbesses who convinced him he needed to be priested. You know, Sister One kind of beat him up, and <laughs> Sister Two beat him up. You can't really argue with strong abbesses. So he did um, study in Rome and was ordained a priest in 1901 and returned to North Africa at that point, where he spent the last 15 years of his life as an unofficial chaplain to the French occupying army. I would say that his time as a military person also really influenced his writing and his views of life. What he wanted to do was to be a Christian presence and a universal brother to the people in whose home he had taken up residence. And while the precise circumstances of his death are unclear, um, he was murdered as kind of fallout of the First World War um, at the fortress that he had built to protect the people in the village where he lived. There were marauders that were being armed by a, a third party. We could talk about this in terms of modern politics, but I'll not do that. But um, So he had built a fortress to protect the folks from these marauders and, and was killed. It's a life pattern that's familiar to a lot of you. If you've read St. Augustine, um, or uh, if you know the pattern that was set forth by St. Gregory the Great, where a very privileged early life is followed by profligacy and sybaritic behavior, and then there is a moment of conversion and subsequent saintliness. Um, this is the pattern of, of Foucault's life, of Brother Charles' life. It's not unfamiliar. What is, I think, almost entirely unique about it is the degree to which Islam led to his saintliness. And more on that in, in a moment. Um, so this brings us in our outline to the point of the return to the Roman Catholic Church. It wasn't conversion, really, because he had never been a, an unbeliever. He'd been an, an unpracticer and a questioner, I think. Um, there's a wonderful book that I recommend to you by Ali Merad, who wrote the, an evaluation of Foucault from a Muslim perspective. Uh, most of the Christian material is quite hagiographical, and so it's really interesting to see Foucault from another perspective. And he, write, almost, he writes that almost continually confronted by Islam, his expedition to Morocco, his journey through Algeria, his time as a pilgrim in the Holy Land, his time in Syria as a Trappist monk, his life in Nazareth in Jerusalem, and finally in the Algerian Sahara, he was always in the context of the homes of Islam. Uh, Foucault, in fact, confided to a friend of his, quote, 
I like Islam very much, and Islam produced in me a profound upheaval. My exposure to this faith and to the soul living always in the presence of God helped me understand there is something greater and something more than the pleasures of the world. Foucault's friends often remarked in their letters and in their writings about him the, um, the, the influence that the Islamic world had and the Islamic faith in particular had on him. A French general said, should we admit in private that Islam influenced Foucault to the extent of leading him to the brink of conversion? And he wrote about the moving outward signs of Islamic faith, the, the, pra the, prayer, the prayers every day, going again, uh, repeated again and again, the long months of moral solitude among Muslims whose acts are deliberately placed under the divine will, led Foucault to the idea of an absolute religious mysticism. Another friend of Foucault's wrote, when you live among Muslims, you are well aware that Islam has its attraction. I, I've had the privilege twice of, of living among Muslims, and that's absolutely true. I mean, it is absolutely true. There is something um, it, uh, magnetic almost about God's presence in the M Muslim world. And I say that as a Christian. Massignon says that Islam acted as the catalyst to bring Foucault back to Christian doctrine. I think that's a wonderful idea that one religious tradition could lead someone back to their own tradition. We'll talk more about that if you want to. Many of the modern students of Foucault concur with Massignon but um, the Muslim who wrote the book on, on Foucault is, is more um, circumspect. And he writes, the exhilarating atmosphere of the desert certainly led the worldly young officer to rediscover, if not the world of prayer, at least that of religious fervor. He thinks that Islam played a role in the development of Foucault's religious awareness. Quote, Islam was at the starting point of his spiritual journey. His religious life and work would develop in constant contact with Islam. Now that's true, and it's not true, because he was raised as a Christian. He, came, he was instructed as a, in, in a Christian family. So it, he's a very interesting character because he had very good religious education by 19th century lights in the Catholic Church, and then, as many people do at various times, moved away from his own tradition, and then somebody else's tradition really caught his imagination and showed him something about the nature of God. So this leads us then to the section of the talk on surprising attitudes and limitations. Um, from the outset of his return to Roman Catholicism and Christianity, Foucault never forgot his experiences with Islam and the desert. And part of that experience was for him the reality of the almost total absence of a Christian presence. The Christians that Merton, uh, that, um, <laughs> Oops, Merton. I wrote a doctoral dissertation on Thomas Merton. I've never gotten over it. You never sort of get over the doctoral exams, right? Um, the the, the um, Christians with whom uh, Brother Charles associated in North Africa actually were, were French soldiers. And soldiers are not noted in most countries for their piety and their kindness and their gentleness and their goodness to the people there. Um, li they're living over. Um, after the Trappist monasticism and after priestly or or ordination, Foucault became convinced that he should be that Christian presence in North Africa. Um, he wanted people in North Africa, Muslims, to have experienced a Christian other than the Christian um, military presence in North Africa. 
Um, the paradoxical reality that I think is so interesting in his life, or at least interesting to me, is that he was on the one hand a son and a soldier of France, with all that implied in the 19th century in North Africa, committed to French cultural ideals, and, and he was also a son of Christ and a fervent lover of Jesus and committed to being a universal brother because of his Christian commitment. So it's, it's two sides of a, of a very paradoxical um, coin. So let me say something about a son of France and a son of, of Christ. Um, biographies of Foucault tend toward the hagiographical, and they almost all omit or play down the fact that although he resigned his military commission, he never rescinded his um, allegiance to France and France's goals in North Africa in the 19th century. Now, if you're a historian, you know it's a not very happy story. Um, his correspondence with his friends and family, his military and religious superiors, made it very clear that Foucault felt that France's duty was to colonize and evangelize the, the countries that, that it occupied. Let's call it what it was, its occupation. Like many nationalists in the 19th century, he didn't see any intrinsic difficulty with what you and I would call colonialism. And I think we just have to say that. Um, you know, saints are not perfect. Saints are saints, but they aren't perfect, and they are people of their own time. Um, nor did he object to the extending and pre preserving empire by means of military occupation. He objected to brutality and, and exploitation, but he didn't think it was a bad idea. In fact, he said, um, he, he talked about civilization, civilizing peoples because savages can't be Christians. Now, you know, that just makes me cringe, that, that kind of language. But that was the language of the 19th century. I suffer as a Frenchman, he wrote to a friend, to see natives not being ruled as they should be ruled. The inadequate condition of peoples is made worse by treating them as no more than a means of material acquisition. He wrote to his closest friend and confidant, his cousin Marie de Bondé, that there was not enough attention being paid to saving Muslim souls during the 80 years that um, France had occupied Algeria. If the Christians of France, he writes to his cousin, do not understand it's part of their duty to evangelize, evangelize their colonies, it is an error, error for which they will be accountable, and it will be the cause of losing a great number of souls that could have been spared. Now, that's not the language that Foucault uses later on, when he's had a little more time to figure out how to be a guest in somebody else's home. I might use the wrong fork or say the wrong thing or show the soles of my feet, but if I stay long enough in the house, I'll learn not to do those things. So this, this really brings us to the second part of Foucault, who was a son of Christ, a Christian, um, a priest of the church, um, someone whose dedication to Christ was manifested by following what he called the hidden life of Christ in Nazareth. Um, Foucault strove to unite himself by living an obscure life among ordinary people. You know, he didn't want to be famous. He, he didn't go out to dinner on the fame of his book on North Africa. He believed, now I'm quoting him, it's possible to do good without using words, without preaching, without fuss, but by silence and giving a good example. The example of poverty, loneliness, recollection, withdrawal, the obscurity of a life hidden in God, a life of prayer, penance and withdrawal, completely lost in God and buried in God. And he believed this was done by living someplace ordinary and making your living by your own hands. Which leads us to the missionary method of Charles de Foucault. Long before Vatican II or modern missiological theory, 
he understood that evangelism was probably best carried out by Jesus, by living like Jesus did among people who didn't know him. We, we evangelize best by trying to be Christ-like among people who don't know Christ or the Christian tradition. He wanted to be a Christian presence in a place that had never, except for military occupiers, really experienced Christians. And so that's why he uses the term of himself, universal brother. In 1902, he wrote, I want to accustom all inhabitants, Christians, Muslims, Jews, and non-believers to look on me as their brother, as their universal brother. In a meditation in 1916, the last year of his life, he wrote, may it be that Christ lives in me. I have to proclaim the image of the Lord in his hidden life. I proclaim by my life the gospel from the rooftops. Be kind, be compassionate, see Jesus in all people. We must humiliate ourselves and convert ourselves first. It's a very wonderful attitude, kind and compassionate. Rahman Arahim, God the merciful and the compassionate. You know, this is at, at root. Uh, already a deep point of convergence between the two. And it's an attitude that I think is particularly appropriate in an Islamic context. Because from the Muslim point of view, the most eloquent way to um, espouse the authenticity of our gospel message as Christians is to be like Jesus. You're supposed to nod if you're Christian, so I don't know. No? Oh, at least two people are nodding and smiling. Thank you. Um, imitation of the prophet, peace be upon him. Imitation of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, actually appears in the Holy Quran. You have in the messenger of Allah, says the Quran, an excellent exemplar. Uh, Surah 33, Ayah 21, chapter 33 verse 21. The Algerian reformers of Islam at the time of Foucault were reminding Muslims, be like the prophet Muhammad. Be like Jesus. You know, pick a really holy person and, and model yourself on that person. The great lesson that emerges from the solitary silent life of Charles de Foucault writes one of his biographers, is his humility, his gentleness, and his charity. Sounds like Jesus to me. I am humble uh, in heart, right? Humility, gentleness, charity. This, this does not surprise us if we're Christians. Christians recognize these as the characteristics of Jesus, whom the Quran commands and whom Muslims admire as a prophet of God. He's not our Jesus. He's the Jesus of the world. And other religious traditions recognize this. Um, uh, the Quran records, and now I'm quoting the Quran again, thou wilt find the nearest in friendship to the believers to be those who say we are Christians. I mean, the Quran is quite straightforward. That's Surah 5, uh, Ayah 52, chapter 5, verse 52. I'm a Baptist Muslim. I know how to quote chapter and verse. <laughs> um, so the key word, I think, or the key words are um, friendship and um, being an exemplar, living in your life what you um, say that you believe in your faith, which leads me then to the final um, aspect of Foucault's witness to um, Islam. And I think it might be the most troubling for some Christians. It would certainly have troubled my grandmother and my parents who you know, were great supporters of missionaries and saving unbelievers and so forth. But um, I, let me begin this little 
that might, part that might be squirmy for some of us, and we can talk about it if we have time uh, at the end. Um, Foucault did not think of himself as a missionary, if by missionary we mean somebody who seeks to convert other people. Um, according to Merad, uh, the Muslim who wrote about Foucault, his profound desire was to prepare the Sahara, the Saharan souls to receive the gospel. He quotes a letter um, that Foucault wrote, it is not evangelization in the strict sense of the word. I am not capable of that, and the time has not come, writes Foucault. I am the preparer for the work of evangelization, um, the establishment of confidence and of friendship. And when I first read that, I thought, gosh, he thinks he's John the Baptist. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not the one. The, the one is coming. I'm not the, the great evangelist because it's not the time for that yet. Remember, Paul says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. It wasn't the fullness of time, so he sends John the Baptist first. Not the fullness of time. So Foucault, this is a, a way of looking at this. Um, one of the biographies of Foucault um, devotes the last chapter of the book um, to a new kind of monk with a new kind of mission. And it stresses Brother Charles as primarily a monk who wanted to live the hidden life of Nazareth in North Africa. Um, he wrote to a friend, I'm not a missionary. The good Lord did not give me what it takes to be one. I am seeking to live the life of Nazareth. You know, I, I, there, there are missionaries. He doesn't oppose that. But that isn't his charism. That isn't his calling, if I can put it in that way. The curate at St. Augustine's in, in Paris, who facilitated Foucault's return to the church, had given a lot of talks during the time Foucault was coming back to Catholicism, stressing that, and now I'm quoting some material from one of the talks, Christ had come first to save the little folks, the suffering, the poor, and to love them. When we wish to convert a soul, we must not preach. We must show love. Um, Foucault took his spiritual father's teachings to heart. Deep down, I think, Foucault recognized that to love is enough. And to love is not always to convert. But it's, first of all, to listen and to learn from people of a different civilization. The first step is to listen and to share and to be a good guest in somebody else's home. Foucault noted, it's not necessary at this time to seek isolated conversions. He told a Protestant missionary, I'm not here to convert the Tuareg in a single stroke, but to understand them. I'm sure that the Lord will welcome in heaven those who lead good and upright lives without having to be Roman Catholics. <gasps> I might get in, guys. <laughs> I'm an Anglican. I'm an English Catholic. I'm the wrong kind of Catholic. <laughs> but, but I think this is quite remarkable for a person of the depth of faith and the depth of Christian, Christian understanding. Uh, I think that the good Lord will welcome into heaven good people. Uh, we can argue about that. Another remark that was recorded um, is Foucault said, you're a Protestant, so he's talking to a Protestant. Tisser has no religious faith at all. The Tuareg are Muslims. I am convinced that God will welcome all of us if we deserve it. Um, well, I don't know whether we want to talk about universal salvation or let you argue that when you go back to class. But not long after Louis Massignon, not long after Louis Massignon's conversion, he met with Charles de Foucault and reported um, of his concern um, as long, and I'm quoting, as long as we do not respect the human being and the non-Christian believers we are trying to convert, we are betraying God. Conversion is not a shipping permit we attach to the conscience of others. It is a deepening of the best in their pre present religious loyalties. 
that's a very interesting way for a Roman Catholic priest and monastic to think about it. And it, of course, echoes the Holy Quran. Quoting the Holy Quran, for every one of you, we apport, uh, appointed a way. This is, of course, the voice of God. For every one of you, we appointed a way. And if Allah had pleased, he would have made you a single people. So vie with each other in virtuous deeds. I mean, that's, you know, re revealed to the prophet. If God had wanted to have one religion, God would have made everybody to have one religion. But that's not the way, that was not the will of Allah. So what we need to do is to try to, every, every one of us should try to be better than the others of us. You know, not, not kill each other or, or take over each other's lands. But we, sh we should all try to be better than somebody else, which is, that's an okay kind of competition, I think. And I'm not too competitive, but, but that's one I can buy, buy, I think. Foucault's Saharan life represents um, an existence center, centered on an ideal of holiness that was reflected in the humble imitation of Jesus. That's what Foucault wanted people in North Africa to see. The humility and the love of Jesus Christ. As a Muslim, Mirad thought it was the most authentic way that the gospel could possibly be presented in North Africa. And Foucault himself wrote, the sanctification of peoples in this in the sanctification of the peoples of this religion is in my hands. They will be saved if I become a holy person. That's the best reason I can think of to be holy. Somebody else will be saved if I'm really a, a holy person. They will be saved if I become a holy person. My big job is not working on somebody else. <laughs> it's working on Bonnie. <laughs> right? Okay. That's the first time I've ever used right. I said I would never use it because it's the way we hiccup now in our conversation. We start, well, you know, we, it's the way we pause to go on to something else. Mea maxissima culpa. Okay, let me close now with, um, with some brief reflections, few observations on the practical implications of this for us since we've come together as you know, Christians and Muslims and other religious traditions. Um, uh, let, let's think about some of this. Um, and and I, I admit that these, um, these observations are primarily addressed to people who might be privileged to live with other folks, people who are part of another religious tradition. And as I am a Christian, um, these suggestions are necessarily um, uh, slanted toward my co-religionists, <laughs> but I think maybe they can be generally helpful. And if not, those of you who aren't Christian can help me. <laughs> Don't leave me in my sin. If I'm wrong, <laughs> help me. <laughs> So first, if a Christian lives in a predominantly non-Christian culture, as I have been able to do several times in my life, um, it's really important and practical to remember that we are guests in another person's home. A good guest observes the conventions of the host's home. She does not impose her ways on it. It's important, if possible, to learn the other person's language and respect his or her culture by learning as much as possible about it. Foucault was the first person to make dictionaries of the Tuareg language. He had thousands of pages of dictionary because it was an oral culture. They weren't a written culture. He invited all the grannies in and made them tea and had them tell their long poems that told the stories of their history which, of course, they had memorized. Granny taught it to somebody and taught it to somebody. And he was such a good listener that he could memorize the poetry that the grannies told and record it so that someday they would have it. I think that's extraordinary. I think that's really a wonderful thing to do. I think of all the missionaries that I was brought up um, being told about and how they would translate into Chinese or Mandarin or African languages or whatever. Um, it, it's really important to start by immersing oneself 
in the home in which one finds oneself. It's not necessary or maybe even possible to participate in every aspect of another person's culture. I mean, I'm a Christian. There are things I can't do or I don't think I should do. Maybe I'm wrong. Father, you can correct me on this. But, um, but it is necessary to try to understand and to respect. We are privileged when we have the opportunity to visit somebody else's home. And again, I'm quoting Foucault. Everything we do for our neighbor, we do for Jesus himself. And that's the life of Nazareth. You know, everything we do for the neighbor, we do for Jesus. Secondly, um, I think of Foucault's understanding of being a universal brother defines his method, and it points the way for us. It means that we try to live as a sibling among siblings. And I don't know about your family, but I didn't always get along with all my siblings, but we still were part of the same family. So it doesn't mean that we won't have misunderstandings or disagreements, but we, we, look at, uh, we look at one another as the human family. We can't not do this. We won't survive unless we begin to take to heart this teaching of Foucault, that we look at everybody as brothers and sisters. In the Christian tradition, many of you know, St. Paul uses the language of family and of siblings for the baptized Christians. And I think in the West, we Christians have never fully understood the meaning of Paul's teaching, which is that every other Christian I am to treat as my biological siblings. I owe all of you here who are Christians exactly what I owe my mother or my brother. This is what it means. Um, and uh, we have the same responsibility for them that we have for our our siblings, our parents, our grandparents. Um, whoever does the will of God, says my Lord Jesus, is my mother and brother and sister. So if a Muslim does the will of God, she's my sister. So says Jesus. I didn't make this stuff up. It's in the book. Um, it, it's reflected, I think, in the parabol parabolic saying that when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. This is fundamental Christianity in my view. Look upon every human being as a beloved brother. This appears over and over and over again in Foucault's writing. Look at everybody as a beloved one. And finally, and related, um, Fou uh, I'm going to use my own language here, but that I think Christians need to learn to see the world with baptized eyes. We don't see the world in a secular way, but we see the world with baptized eyes. You know, um, Old Testament stories, David, uh, the, the one who didn't look so good was the one God had chosen, the barren wife. I have an Old Testament scholar here. I don't want to stay in the Old Testament too long. I'll have to move into my own testament. But, um, you know, that this is a biblical, this is a deeply biblical idea that God doesn't look at us the way we look at each other. So let's get with the program. Um, Foucault said categorically in three or four places, see Jesus in all people. See Jesus in all people. And then he pr provides a very practical and challenging way to do this. Quoting, to be able to see to be able to truly see others, we must close our physical eyes and open the eyes of our souls. Let us see what they are from within, not from what they appear to be. Let us look at them at the same, let us look at them the same way God looks at them. So to try to see as God sees, with Rahman Arahim, with mercy and compassion is a principle, I think, that applies universally and certainly universally in, in Christianity and Islam and mostly in Judaism as well. But certainly we who you know, have a, a revealer and a book, the al-Demi uh, among us, to see others as God looks at us is the great challenge for us. Um, Finally, uh, I think Michel Lafont is exactly correct when he writes that um, Charles de Foucault, by his life and example, has given us an example of inclusivity. 
I don't know how well Foucault knew the Holy Quran, but I think his life reflects this truth from the Holy Quran. We believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you. And our God and your God is one. And to him we both submit. That's a wonderful Quranic verse, chapter 29, uh, uh, Ayah 46. Um, but we believe that God has revealed him, God's self to us. Um, and, and we Christians and Muslims are charged to be those who submit to the God of compassion and mercy. Um, certainly, this is the impulse behind um, Charles de Foucault's famous prayer of abandonment. And um, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to read it in closing. And I also have, this is so old-fashioned, I have holy cards of Charles de Foucault, which I ordered for you. So um, maybe you can pass them out. Don't take what is still time. We don't have any. But let me just read to you. Bear in mind this Quranic verse that we believe in that which has been revealed to us. And our God and your God is one. And to God we are to submit. Um, the prayer is on the back. And I'm going to only change one word. And I'm going to change Father to Allah. Because when I do that, the prayer crosses a boundary very quickly. So here's the prayer. Allah, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence. For you are Allah. You are our God. Thank you. Um, I'm willing to entertain questions, objections, <laughs> agreements. Just don't throw anything at me, please. <laughs> I'm very happy to. Uh, yes. Oh, do you want me to come there? Okay. Are you gonna? Are you gonna um, keep people from throwing stuff yes. at me? Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Yes, uh, I have been asked to, to moderate a little bit, but I know from experience that people need a moment to digest. Perfectly fine. So let me cookie. begin. <laughs> let me begin with my first question, kind okay, of an that's observation. Good. That's fine. Charles, uh, Brother Charles, entered into another culture in order to, to meet the other. Mm -hmm. And we're, our, our day now, you don't have to travel to North Africa. To meet the other. That's right. But you do have to find the pathway to their door. That's right. I was taken while you were talking that this is uh, one of those wonderful times when Lent and Ramadan yes, come will, right over, together. Will, will overlap. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit of that as a way for people, maybe our students, to begin to find the path from one door to another. If you're going to be a, a guest in somebody's home, you have to learn how to get to their home and how to knock on the door. Well, I think there's another, uh, uh, another step. I don't want to be disagreeable, but mm -hmm. I think we have to be invited to somebody else's home, and mm -hmm. especially the religious home. Sure. You know, we have to be very careful about our approach. Um, all of us know of a religious tradition in the United States that knocks on your door with magazines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and most of us are not real taken by that. <laughs> it, it's not a good approach for, for most folks anymore. Um, so I think we have to be very gentle in the way that we do this. Um, I really think groups like the CCMD are, are so important. 
and to find venues in which we can come together as people of goodwill is just so important. And especially when we both have a, a, fa a season of fasting that overlaps. In fact, I used Islam a couple of weeks ago uh, in a teaching I was doing in a Christian church. Somebody said, oh, well, why do we have to fast? That's so old fashioned. And I said, well, let me tell you why Muslims fast in Ramadan. And you know, people's eyes went, <laughs> you know, I reminded them it, it, we're, we become in solidarity with people who don't have as much as we do. Um, you know, it helps us to control the impulses of our bodies. I'm sure your bodies don't have impulses, but I've got troubles. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I think this is, we, we have to put ourselves where people can find us. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if we only stay in our own little enclaves, you know, of, of, I mean, Pittsburgh is a city of enclaves. I love it. It's, you know, there's the, there's the Eastern European section and there, there was the hill until, Amer until the white Americans bulldozed it. Uh, you know, there, Squirrel Hill is a, is a religious conclave. Um, if we stay in our own neighborhoods, it won't happen. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to risk putting ourselves um, in somebody else's neighborhood. In Wheeling, um, where I'm living, I live near right now, there's a Ukrainian Catholic church. And a bunch of people asked if they might come to the Cat U Ukrainian Catholic church last Sunday so that they could just be there and, and pray in solidarity. That I thought was just the right kind of gentle, may we come. Mm -hmm. You know, can we be part of it? So I, I, th I think that, and the other thing I think is that we live in such a secular society that we don't have to go to other people who are religious, <laughs> you know, who are already faithful in their own tradition. Um, we, we, got, we all have plenty of friends and, and plenty of places in the world where, you know, our fellow Americans or, you know, Caucasians or however you want to define it are not at all religious. And so to be a different kind of person, mm -hmm. you know, to, to carry Jesus to the giant, giant eagle, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Dantan, <laughs> that's a really important thing to do. It's very good. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. I've given people a moment to digest. Because we have people online, you have to come and use the microphone, Father. You must use the microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much for this uh, powerful lecture. You're most welcome. And um, a comment and then a, a, a question, or maybe a question first. Uh, like what happened to the Fuku? This, what happened to uh, Charles de Fuku discovering his faith? Uh, like discovering his faith uh, through um, the experience of Islam, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, yeah. through the experience of another way of pray, mm -hmm. praying and still remaining um, mm -hmm. uh, a French uh, colonial officer. Mm -hmm. uh, Algeria was one of the worst. It was, uh, absolutely. One of the worst ex French yeah, experience. Terrible. And it has not stopped even until now, the, right. the PNR and so on. That's true. Uh, there is a spirit and friend of mine who also was living in Algeria. I, I'm just wondering when you are talking because uh, his experience was uh, pretty close. And yet he remained um, uh, that uh, evangelistic Catholic missionary, Remy Yu, like every time he says every morning, you know, they wake you up in the morning and the, and the, the Allahu, Allahu Akbar, and he wanted to hear that, that Jesus is the greatest as well. Sure. Like the missionary in him uh, reacted that way. Uh, could you say more? Could, uh, first of all, the, 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 the impact of the French, uh, yeah. the French, um, French culture, yeah. even the French enlightenment on the other, you know, like looking down on the other. And um, how he was unable to get beyond that, and yet how he was able to rediscover himself yeah. and rediscover his faith and 
transformation. I, I, I find it. Uh, yeah, it's it, a it, wonderful it, it, question. It, 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 yeah. Because you really highlight what, what are the two really paradoxical sides of, of Foucault. Um, I think he was really, and I, I mean, I'm not a Foucault scholar, so I'm an I'm a, a admirer of um, Foucault, but I think he was completely, in a sense, had blinkers, blinders, when it came to French colonialism in Algeria. He was trained in two military academies. Um, he, he, you know, it was a period of enormous colonialism all over Africa by European nations. And, and I, I think he was just blinkered. You know, I, 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 I don't, I can't, I can't explain it or, um, and I certainly don't condone it. What it does for me is to make me ask myself, how am I blinkered? Hmm. What is it that I can't see in the world because of the kind of background I had, you know, because of the country I grew up in? But I think you're, you're absolutely right that, that there is this almost disjuncture within this man. And the, 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 what happened to him with Islam was I, was I, I simply think he saw the profound devotion of Islam, which is so public in, in many countries, certainly in North Africa. You know, he writes about things would stop and people would go pray and come back. I, I had a, a mad trip. I don't recommend this. I was much younger than I am now. I'd never do it now. But I went across the Sinai Desert <laughs> walking and with camels and led by, by um, Muslim Bethlehem. guides to get to St. Catherine's, mm -hmm. the famous monastery in Sinai. And we would stop. And, you know, the, the Muslims would go off and, and would have their prayers. And then we would pick up and go. It was extremely moving. And I was there with, you know, bunch of priests mm -hmm. and nuns and you know it's not like we were irreligious but there was all I, I mean I'm, I guess it's a witness that um, the convicted faith of the believers is very powerful to other people you know it's very powerful if you get up and go to mass on Sunday when everybody else is getting over a hangover it is really a powerful witness you don't have to say anything remember college. Of course, I was never going to college. <laughs> Don't tell my grandmother she belonged to the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, that, that public, there's something, and I think this Foucault did profoundly understand that there's something very powerful about quietly being who you are religiously, being who you are spiritually. You, you don't have to it, it doesn't have to be an I love Jesus t-shirt, you know, which is okay. I'm not opposed to that. But but in quiet ways, if you're really con convicted and living what the degree of your faith that you understand, it's a very powerful witness. But I think you really put your finger exactly on the, and I suppose it's one of the reasons I find Foucault so interesting. Because on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, on the one hand, his writing has been so helpful to me spiritually and in prayer. And on the other hand, I, I know the history of North Africa. And I think, but who of us is not this way? <laughs> you know, who of us is not this way? Thank you, Dr. Preston. Very nice presentation. Never heard about a brother Charles before, and I learned a lot today. Yeah. My question is, I'm curious, why did he enter Morocco as a Jew and not as a Christian? Because he couldn't go in as a Christian. It was close, and it was close to the French then. I see. Okay. Yeah, okay. And that, I was that's just a curious. Really, yeah, it's a very kind of weird and, and interesting piece of the Foucault story. Yeah. He got an old rabbi to teach him Hebrew and they you know the the, the Jew the Jewish folks were able to go through sort of as tinkers or sales you know selling stuff in 
in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And he actually had to be secret about m making his notes. He made these robes that had like secret pockets in so he could have a little piece of a pencil and a little piece of paper so he could make the drawings of the, mm -hmm. you know, the geography yeah. and so and forth. Did he talk about any interaction with Jewish people in Morocco or in other places? Not too much. The, um, not too much. Well, I, I, I have not read all of his journals in French, so I have to say my, my knowledge is limited on this. That's fair enough. But um, during the Moroccan visit, he, he would have been in big trouble if they'd have found out that he wasn't Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I think they kept to themselves pretty much. And well, the fear was always that they would be discovered mm -hmm. as, as not yeah. who they were presenting themselves as being. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, there was a certain spy part of mm -hmm. this. Back to your question, you know, he was he was a soldier gathering secret data for the French army. I mean, really, that's what it boils down to. That doesn't sound very holy or no, saintly, no, but no. But <laughs> that's that's the truth. You know, that's what he was up to. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Bunny. This this is. Uh, actually quintessential of what the consortium was set up to accomplish. I'm so glad. Uh, Alhamdulillah. 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 Exactly. This, is, this is very uplifting. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to thank our colleague, uh, Therese, who discovered um, but, um, Charles and you. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is very enlightening. My, I've had two experiences that have really touched me, and you touched on this, especially the aspect of his, his work as a missionary mm -hmm. and almost running away from the concept of being a missionary. Uh, and I think it was because he was, he was in the world of the old concept of missionary yes. who, who is invited to go and convert people. It was very 19th century, that, that absolutely. absolutely right. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm really taken into the understanding of the appreciation of a guy of the early 19th, I mean, late 19th century, early 20th century, who was beginning to rediscover a new way to be a missionary. Yeah. Now, I had two experiences I wanted to share. One is an encounter I had with the director of Catholic Relief Services mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, and he was working in Morocco. I was excited to hear him. I grew up with a lot of Muslim influence, so mm -hmm. I, I love to hear some of those stories. So after he shared his experience, they've been there for 10, he had been there for 10 years plus, mm -hmm. uh, and how they've been embraced by the community where they work. My next question to him, I just wanted to be the devil's advocate, and I asked him, how many Catholics do you have, have you made since you <laughs> worked there? And he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and he said, none. I was like, okay. But co baptized two people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said to me that their job was not going there to find people be, to become Christians or Catholics. Their job was to go serve humans, human beings God has allowed them to reach out to. Um, I, 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 was, I was completely dumbfounded hearing that. My other experience was, I was just talking to Father Bill Christie earlier, I, I encountered some spiritans who are currently working in Algeria. We they invited me for a forum in Zanzibar, and they were talking about their experience with their Muslim community members. And again, quietly, I asked one of the priests, how many have you converted? And he said, he's been there for five to 10 years, uh, up to 10 years, not one. And I was like, how do you assess your mission? He said, because we are a presence. We go there to witness, and we're happy to encounter. So my question to you is, how do we 
how are we going to be missionaries? How do we become missionaries? Yeah. Because I think there's a new way to understand being a missionary. Yeah, I've been and a, what is your yeah. take Th- on this being is a missionary? A, I knew this would come up. And um, it's another whole conversation for another evening. And then don't all the students leave, because I want to have any student wants <laughs> to ask a question um, to have an opportunity to, to do that, if any of you want to want to call you. But um, it, I think about this a lot. I mean, I was commissioned twice by the church I grew up in to serve overseas as a missionary. <laughs> and I don't know that I converted anybody, but I don't convert anybody anyway. God brings souls to God. Right? We, we can present choices. We can we can. Tell the love of Jesus. I mean, I know I have all <laughs> my brother here, and I could sing missionary hymns for you. <laughs> we 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 know a lot in common. I'm quite sure of of um, of hymns, but I, I I guess this is very simple minded. Two things: one, to be a missionary is to do what Jesus did, and that is to love people. And sometimes we love them by teaching them, and sometimes we love them by getting them medical care, and sometimes, you know, that's, we, we, we are missionaries because we love people, and that's what our Lord did, and so that's what we're called to do. And the second thing is, um, I don't know who is converted and who isn't. Only God knows the hearts of people. I mean, you know, you've all heard the stories about rice Christians, I'm sure. Anybody who's read, you know, missionary, missiology, people who converted and were baptized so they could get their kids into school or get enough for their children to eat or, um, you know, is is somebody who who is studying Jesus in a non-Christian country converted or not converted is somebody who was baptized as an infant and never darkened the doors of anybody's church again. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, I, I don't have an answer to the question. I don't know what the answer is because I grew up with a conviction that it's important to let people meet Jesus. You know, it's important to share our, our faith in Jesus. But, um, but I'm also... Now, more convinced as I'm maybe older and a little bit nicer than I used to be, um, that the judging of who is and who isn't is not up to me. Very good. You know, that the judging of who is or isn't is not up to me. But sometime I'd love to talk together, maybe in a small group sometime, two things that this question involves that we can't do tonight. One is, what is salvation? What is it? Who's in charge of it? And two, what do we mean by Jesus? I mean, I can think of three different ways we could talk about the person of Jesus, and and each way would have implications for missiology, for, mm-hmm. for how we share him. So I don't, you know, I should have shut up. I should have said I don't know and shut up, shouldn't I? <laughs> Do any of the students have a question? I don't, mm-hmm. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but sometimes when the professors carry on like we are want to do, <laughs> my brothers and sisters, um, you know, if there's a student who'd like to ask a question. Nope. Okay. Well, very good. I think that for their sake, because they do also have to I get on to their say, next you lectures. I have other things they need to do this evening. If I could ask you for, for one final word on because I'm sure that one of the things that they've been studying is this idea of a ministry of presence yeah. that that began very much with uh, Brother Charles. Yeah. So if you could, in just, uh, you know, that thesis, st- you know, that first paragraph of the paper for them, help them with that first paragraph, what is a ministry of presence? I think it, it, it's living authentically what you really believe. I mean, if we are Christians, then we must live authentically all the time, every place, what we understand about the Lord Jesus. It's not easy. 
Well, no, it's not easy for me. You're all going to be saints, so that's okay for you. But, you know, I think this is very, to be a presence is to, um, you know, Muslims must, must, must show us the Quran and, and the will of God in their lives. Uh, my ministry of presence is to be as much like our Lord and his mother <laughs> as I can possibly be. That's the ministry of presence. It, it doesn't have a lot to do with what I say or, you know, fancy talks or whatever, because I think we have more um, opportunity to convince people of things if we love them, first of all, um, than if we try to argue them. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a great evangelist. He used to go into a town and preach, and when he got enough people, they'd build a church, and then he'd go someplace else. So I come from, from a background of that kind of evangelism, and he used to shake his head and say, convince a man against his will, he'll be of the same opinion still. <laughs> so there's something about presence that is deeper than an argument or a historical statement. That's why universities like Duquesne are important. You know, this is a university where if you're a Christian, you can be a Christian here. You know, I was real lucky. I went to a, a Christian college in my day, ages and ages ago, and it was okay to be Christian here. I don't mean, you know, be full of Miss Sunshine or anything, but um, take some time during the last part of Lent to think about what you really do believe. I mean, it's a big package, Christianity. I've thrown a lot of stuff out in seven years. <laughs> Think about what you really do believe, and then live that. Well, I thank you so very much. And Privilege. on behalf of our, our, our uh, group here, uh, the students who are present, those who are online, uh, the, the Consortium uh, for Christian and Muslim Dialogue, and everybody who joined in, we thank you so very much. It's a privilege. Thank you. And I think all the students ought to get extra points on their final and their papers for, like, sticking it out, right? The ones who came tonight. Yes. Pretty that's, good, huh? You, you can, you can give man. me the, you know, dollar bill after the thing, but you guys ought to get extra credit now. And please treat yourselves to the refreshment as you leave. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Father Chrissy. Uh, and thank you, Bernie. Privilege. Yes.